Hi, and thanks for joining me for tutorial 11. In this session, we're going to finish up our discussion of survival analysis, including the Kaplan-Meier method and Cox proportional hazards regression. So in the last session, we left off talking about Kaplan-Meier curves. We talked about how the log rank test can be used to compare survival curves between two groups. With the null hypothesis that there's no difference in survival between the two groups compared, and the alternative hypothesis that the survival curves are different. The log rank test is sort of like a chi-squared test. It compares the observed number of deaths for each group versus the expected if there was no relationship between survival and the explanatory variable. So let's revisit the example from the last tutorial where we were comparing the survival curves for those under and over age 40. Just by looking at the survival curves between the two groups, it appears that there's a difference, with those over 40 having shorter survival than those under 40. But we can statistically test if there is a significant difference in survival for the two age groups with the log rank test. However, the log rank test does not allow us to adjust for confounders. This tests the difference in survival between the two age groups, ignoring other factors and there may be other factors at play that we aren't controlling for here. So let's look at the output from the log rank test. Since the p-value of the log rank test is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and have evidence to believe that the survival functions are different for the two age groups, ignoring other factors. Those over 40 appear to have shorter survival time compared to those under 40, ignoring other factors but there are several limitations to using the Kaplan-Meier method. The first is that it can't incorporate numeric explanatory variables. It can only incorporate categorical Xs. So we can stratify on those categories of that variable that we want to adjust for and fit survival curves for each category. But we can't include many explanatory variables because we would need a new curve for each group. For example, if we wanted to include three variables, like over versus under 40, male versus female, and high, medium versus low dose, we would have 12 survival functions. Also, since Kaplan-Meier is non-parametric, there is no simpler form to neatly summarize the relationship between x and y. With regression, we have a slope, beta 1, so we can boil down all observations to this one number, which is meant to represent the entire line. But with Kaplan-Meier, there's no way to simplify the relationship. We need the full table or graph. So what if we want to control for other factors that may confound the association between age and survival, including continuous variables? And what if we want to summarize the relationship between age and survival in a simpler form? Kaplan-Meier is not a regression model, so we need to use another method that allows us to summarize the relationship between age and survival, controlling for potential confounders. This brings us to Cox proportional hazards regression. So a Kaplan-Meier analysis is a good starting point. It's useful for initial exploration between variables and survival, and it's also good for simpler data sets, where you don't need to adjust for many variables. But if we want to control for other factors that may confound an association, we need to use Cox proportional hazards regression. So a Cox proportional hazards model is just another type of regression model, like linear, logistic, or Poisson regression. And you can incorporate many explanatory variables, including numeric explanatory variables. It is a semi-parametric method. It does not assume a constant hazard. The hazard is allowed to vary over time. For example, the hazard of relapse after treatment is allowed to change over time. So this time we're modeling the log hazard at time t to get the log hazard ratio and ultimately the hazard ratio. Recall that the hazard means the probability that you die now given that you're alive. It doesn't have much of a useful interpretation on its own, but relative hazards or hazard ratios do. So that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. You'll see in the Cox regression equation that in place of where the intercept is in linear regression, we have the log baseline hazard. The baseline hazard is the hazard at time t for observations when all predictors equal zero. 
An important property of the baseline hazard is that it's unspecified. This is because the baseline hazard is allowed to vary over time, so it doesn't have a fixed value. We actually don't know what the value of the baseline hazard is. It's unspecified because it varies over time, so it won't be in your output. So because we don't know what that baseline hazard is, we can't take all of our values from our regression output and plug it into our regression formula to calculate someone's hazard of an event at a particular time. Because we don't know what that baseline hazard is. This is in contrast to previous models that we've discussed in the course. So we could estimate the mean y with linear regression for those of a given age, gender, and ethnicity, for example. With logistic regression, we could estimate the odds or probability. And with Poisson regression, we could estimate the rate for participants with a given set of x values. But with Cox regression, we can't estimate the hazard of an event at a given time for people with a given set of x values because we don't know the value of the baseline hazard. What we can do with Cox regression is estimate the hazard ratios from our coefficients in order to compare the hazards between groups. So a hazard ratio is like an odds ratio. We're always comparing one group to another. With Cox regression, we're comparing the hazard in a group to the baseline hazard, but we don't know what the value of that baseline hazard is. So the Cox proportional hazard model gives us the advantage of that we can model the ratio of the hazard of experiencing an event at a given time between groups, but we can't estimate the hazard of an event at a particular time. So in some ways, it's not technically correct, but you can think of the baseline hazard as sort of like an intercept. It's the hazard at time t for observations when all predictors equal zero. But we don't label it as an intercept because it varies over time, and therefore we don't know what its value is. We can compare two groups, or the difference for a one unit increase in x, but we can't actually calculate someone's hazard at a particular time because we don't have that baseline hazard. So with Cox proportional hazards regression, we exponentiate the coefficients to get hazard ratios. A hazard ratio is the relative hazard between groups. The hazard ratio is interpreted in a similar way as the rate ratio or odds ratio. If it's less than 1, then the group you're interested in has a lower hazard or a lower instantaneous risk of death compared to the reference group. We can also say that the group of interest has a longer median survival compared to the reference group if the hazard ratio is less than 1. If the hazard ratio is greater than 1, the group you're interested in has a higher instantaneous risk of dying or experiencing the event at a given time compared to the reference group. The coefficients in our output with Cox proportional hazard regression tell us the difference in the log hazard function between two groups, if x is categorical, or the change in the log hazard function for a one unit change in x, if x is continuous. So now we're going to return to our example where we're comparing the relationship between age, so over age 40 versus under age 40, and survival. We fit a simple Cox proportional hazards model with age as the sole explanatory variable and hazard of death as the outcome. The coefficient for over 40 is 0.52 with a p-value of 0.02 which suggests that there is a significant relationship between age and survival. This tells us that at a given point in time, the log instantaneous risk of an event, which is death in this case, is 0.52 higher for those over 40 compared to those under 40. So those over 40 have a higher instantaneous risk of dying at a given time compared to those under 40. So we exponentiate this coefficient to get the hazard ratio which is shown right beside the coefficient. And you can also see this below along with its 95% confidence interval. So you would exponentiate the beta 1 to get 1.69. This tells us that the hazard or instantaneous risk of experiencing the event, which is death in this case, at a given time for the over 40 group is 1.69 times the instantaneous risk of death at a given time for the under 40 group, ignoring all other variables.
If we interpret the confidence interval for the hazard ratio, this tells us that at a given point in time, the hazard of death for those over 40 is between 1.1 and 2.59 times the hazard of death for those under 40. So based on this simple model, do we have evidence to suggest that people who are over 40 have a greater risk of death at a given time compared to those under 40? Yes, the p-value associated with the slope is less than 0.05, and the confidence interval for the hazard ratio does not include 1. We can estimate that, at a given instant in time, someone who is over 40 is 69% more likely to die than someone who is under 40, ignoring all other variables. So these are all of the tests of significance for the Cox model. We have one beta or coefficient for the single variable in our model. These tests are testing whether any of the betas are not equal to zero. So basically, if our model is better than nothing, like the model F statistic with linear regression. So they're all calculating this in a different way than the p-value associated with beta one, which is why we have slightly different p-values, but they're all less than 0.05 and are similar to the p-value associated with beta one because we just have that one variable in our model. So what about possible confounders? We know that there are likely other factors that could impact whether or not you experience death that are also related to age. Let's say that we want to adjust for mismatch level. But before we do that, what do we have to do? First, we have to think through whether or not it makes sense conceptually. You should then also compare those variables statistically. So use bivariable plots, summaries, or tests to examine the association between mismatch level and age, as well as mismatch level and death. I'm not going to do these steps in the interest of time, but you should always think through if a variable makes sense as a confounder, and should also see if this conceptual understanding is reflected in bivariable relationships between the potential confounder and the primary explanatory variable, as well as the potential confounder and the outcome variable. This is particularly important when we're working with logs, as we have been with logistic, Poisson, and Cox regression. This is because even small changes in the beta 1 can have a large confounding influence when beta 1 is logged. So we don't want to rely exclusively on the 10% change rule. And then the next step would be to add mismatch to our model. And what are we looking for now? A change in beta 1. So if age is our main explanatory variable of interest, and we're wanting to know if there is truly an independent relationship between age and death, we look at the change in the age coefficient. So let's compare our beta 1 of 0.52 to our previous model. In our previous model, beta 1 was also approximately 0.52, so there's essentially no change in beta 1. So now let's look at the standard error associated with beta 1. What happened to that? With our model including mismatch, the standard error is about 0.22. In our model without mismatch, the standard error was also about 0.22. So there was little to no change in the standard error. So based on this, what do we think? Mismatch doesn't seem to be doing much. It doesn't look like it's acting as a confounder. And since the standard error didn't decrease, it doesn't look like a predictor. Now we could test to see whether adding mismatch makes the model fit better. And how could we do that? the likelihood ratio test. So we compare two models using the likelihood ratio test, just like we did with linear, logistic, and Poisson regression. So this answers the question, is the full model significantly better than the reduced model? The null hypothesis is that there's no difference between models. The alternative hypothesis is that the full model explains more, it's better. So if we find that there's no difference between the two models, which one should we go with? The reduced model, because we want to go with simpler models whenever possible. So let's look at the results from the likelihood ratio test. We can see that our p-value is quite high at 0.5, which is greater than 0.05. So based on this, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the model that includes mismatch does not increase the model predictive power. So it doesn't look like mismatch is a confounder or make our model better, so we should probably exclude it from our model.
What if we had instead found here that the likelihood ratio test was significant, that our p-value was less than 0.05, even though our previous analyses suggested that it wasn't a confounder? This would mean that mismatch would be another significant predictor. So it's improving our ability to predict the outcome, but it's not confounding the relationship between x and y. So if we're trying to build an effect size model, like we are here, and we're only concerned about the relationship between our primary x and y, we might not want to keep it in the model if we're only interested in true confounders. But if we want to increase the precision of our estimate of the effect, we might decide to keep it in. Or if it was something like age or gender, where you think theoretically it could be important, you could argue to keep it in for face validity. So it's possible that you could have many explanatory variables that are significant predictors, but not confounders. But where you draw the line of what to include or exclude in your model will depend on your research question and other considerations. But if you were fitting a predictive model, how would your approach be different then? Well, you wouldn't be looking for a change in beta 1 because you don't have a primary explanatory variable. You're just looking for x's that predict your outcome. So if a variable was found to be a predictor with a likelihood ratio test with a predictive model, you would want to keep this in your model, but if not, you would exclude it. So now let's turn to the Cox regression assumptions. Similar to previous regression models, the first assumption is that individuals are independent of one another. Also, the events are independent of one another. So if one person experiences an event, that's not going to increase or decrease the likelihood of that person or other people experiencing the event. The second assumption, which is unique to Cox proportional hazard regression compared to other regression models, is that censoring is not informative. This just means that people who stayed in your study are no different from those who were lost to follow-up. If you only have a small number of people who are lost to follow-up, then it makes less of a difference, but that's one of the assumptions that we're making here. The next one is more of a property of the model rather than an assumption, but that's that the baseline hazard is unspecified. So we don't know what that is. Our model doesn't tell us that. We're also assuming that the x values don't change over time. So if you were a smoker at the beginning of the study when we measured it, we assume that you are going to maintain your status as a smoker throughout the study. There are extensions of the Cox model that allow us to account for variables that change over time, such as time-updated Cox models, but we won't talk about these here. Another property is that the log hazard rate is a linear function of the x's. So just like logistic regression, where the log odds was linear function of the x's, or Poisson regression, where the log rate was a linear function of the x's. So we can check for this with residual plots like we did with linear regression, which we'll discuss shortly. And then the final assumption is the proportional hazards assumption, which is probably the assumption that we are most concerned about. So this assumption means that the hazard ratio is the same regardless of whether you're looking at time 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. It doesn't mean that the hazard stays the same. The hazard can vary, but the relative difference between groups compared is constant over time. So therefore, the curves are not going to cross because the hazard ratio is going to stay the same. Let's look at an example of what I mean by this. This is based on one of Mike's figures that he uses to explain the proportional hazards assumption. Recall that Cox regression allows the hazard to change over time. So the instantaneous risk of an event, like relapse after treatment, can change over time. But the main assumption or limitation on this is that hazards must be proportional. The hazard ratio is constant. So the relative difference between two groups being compared must stay constant over time. So for example, in this figure, we are comparing the hazard of an event for group A and B. We can see that the hazard for group A changes over time, and the hazard for group B changes over time. But the relative hazard, or hazard ratio, is constant. The hazards are proportional. The relative difference between groups A and B is constant over time. 
the risk of death between the two groups is the same at all times. Whether it's time one, two, or three, a person in group B is about twice as likely to die than a person in group A. So how can we check the proportional hazard assumption? The first way is to assess the log-log plot. So the log of survival versus the log of time. And what are we looking for? We are looking for convergence, divergence, or crossing of the hazard functions, which would violate the assumption. So we're looking for parallel curves in our log-log plot. If we see these megaphoning out or coming together, especially if they cross, then that's a clear violation. Because if you see that those two curves are crossing, what is that telling you? The hazards are not proportional because they cross. At one point, the hazard was higher in one group than the other, and then at some point, these switched. If you see these megaphoning out or coming together, it's sort of a judgment call as to whether or not the assumption is violated. But if they cross, that's a clear violation. You would be building an inappropriate model because the relationship between those groups is different over time. The relative hazard changes. So giving one hazard ratio is incorrect. You're not representing that relationship properly. If they converge a little bit or diverge a little bit, you have to make a judgment call. So let's take a look at our example. On the left are our original Kaplan-Meier curves that we plotted, and the log-log plot is on the right. When we look at the log-log plot, we see that the lines cross. So the proportional hazards assumption is violated, and it's really not appropriate to use a Cox proportional hazard model in this situation, because the hazard was higher in one group than the other, and then at some point, these switched. Another way that we can check the proportional hazards assumption is Schoenfeld's test. This is kind of like a goodness of fit test in some ways. We haven't talked about goodness of fit tests very much in this course, but the null hypothesis is that the proportional hazards assumption is met. And the alternative hypothesis is that the proportional hazards assumption is not met. If we reject the null, this suggests that the proportional hazards assumption is not met. So you're actually wanting to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So you're looking for a high p-value in this case. You can also calculate the correlation between Schoenfeld's residuals and time. And if this is positive, this suggests that the log hazard ratio increases over time. And if this is negative, this suggests that the log hazard ratio decreases over time. You can also plot the Schoenfeld's residuals to check this assumption. You don't need to know much about the details about this, other than that you want to see a flat line when you plot this, especially in the middle, but some curving of the tails is okay. The third way that you can check the proportional hazards assumption is to add an x times time interaction. So whatever your primary explanatory variable is, times time interaction term. And if there is a significant interaction with time, this indicates that the hazard ratio for a given x is dependent on the time, which violates the proportional hazards assumption. If this interaction is significant, this suggests that the effect of this variable changes with time. So that's saying the hazard ratio varies over time, and therefore the proportional hazards assumption is violated. So there are lots of different ways that you can check this assumption. If the proportional hazards assumption is violated, there are a few potential solutions to address this. The first is to stratify and fit separate Cox models for different levels of X. With this example, you could fit separate models for each of the mismatch groups, and then estimate the hazard ratio for each of these respective groups. Another option is to fit an extended Cox model, which allows the covariates or coefficients to vary over time. And the third option is to include an x times time interaction term in your model, and then estimate the hazard ratio for your primary x, which is age in this case, for different time periods. To check linearity, just like linear regression, you plot the residuals and are looking for a smooth red line. We reviewed how to do this in tutorial one, so I'm not going to discuss this here, 
but this is also a good way to check if there are any outliers that could be impacting your data. Another option is to fit a model with x and x squared, and then compare this to a model with only x to see if the model improves. So just like we did with linear regression. We use the same ways to check for linearity. The next tutorial is our final tutorial for the semester and will be a review of the course material to help you prepare for the final exam. Thanks for watching our video. Stick around guys, because we got lots more.